Good evening, everyone. My name is Uni Kumar, and along with Rebecca Gracias, we are your conveners for the 2020 and 63rd annual Errol Solomon Myers Memorial Lecture. I would like to begin this evening's proceedings by acknowledging the traditional owners. And today, Chris from the Torres Strait Islands will be doing the acknowledgement. Uh, my name is Chris, and I am a proud island man from Kaiwala Gulls and Askes in the Torres Strait. And I'm also a proud Maori, Tongan and Niuean man. I uh, would like to pay my respect to the traditional owners on this country, Mianjin, and acknowledge the Yagara and Turbo people. And I would like to acknowledge their elders, past, present and emerging. As well as I would like to thank each and every one of you here, especially in the field of medicine, a field that now I am part of, and just say, I'm trying to hold back tears, how grateful I am for the work that you do in preserving myself and my people, and also allowing us to be part of that journey and be with you, and how grateful I am to be amongst peers in the world of medicine. And I also want to acknowledge the great work of Dr. Roach here with us, and how he's here to share the things that he has done. And also he shared with me his time up in the Torres Strait and how he got to see my island home, my island of Badu Island and also Horn Island, Marualag, in which, which is where the airport is. And so with that, I am grateful for this opportunity to acknowledge the people of this land and also to acknowledge you here as well. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Errol Solomon Myers. When I first did my quick Google search of Professor Myers as of being nominated for this role, I quickly realized the reason for his legacy. My colleague will expand on his career in medical education, but I believe it is important we touch on Professor Myers' military service. In 1917, Professor Myers served under the 41st Battalion as a regimental medical officer. The Lieutenant Colonel at the time, Hugh Bennett Lewis, who Professor Myers eventually served under, recommended Professor Myers receive an OBE. Quote, I understand his services were brave and unremitting his enthusiasm and organizing ability and his unremitting industry has led me to regard him as a most invaluable officer, end quote. We as medical students at the University of Queensland could not be prouder to have Professor Myers as our founding father. And we hope as students, we can continue his legacy of service, candor and unremitting industry throughout our careers. Professor Myers was a doctor, a surgeon, a passionate advocate for, adv advocate for education, and a man who derived joy from learning. Born in Brisbane, Professor Myers, more affectionately known as Joe, trained in New South Wales, later returning home to undertake his residency at the Brisbane Great General Hospital. During his career, Professor Myers was a general surgeon and teacher of unmatched ability. He taught anatomy and surgical dissection to dental students in Brisbane, establishing an anatomy school within the dental hospital on George Street. From early in his working life, Professor Myers brought the strength of his personality to bear, advocating for the need to establish a school of medicine in Queensland, a triumph achieved finally on 13th March, 1936. Professor Myers became medical dean in 1941 and was one of only two Australians at the time invited to speak at the inaugural conference of the World Medical Education Association. His passion for education was infectious and students couldn't help but be swept up by his enthusiasm for learning. He was well loved and respected by the student body. As such, in July 1957, a year after his death, the UQMS established the E.S. Myers Memorial Lecture to honor his contributions to medicine 
and to his role as one of the most significant founding fathers of the medical school within the University of Queensland. This lecture has continued through these 63 years and today the E.S. Myers Memorial Lecture is one of the largest of its kind in the Southern Hemisphere. It is a special time when UQ medical students invite the university and greater Brisbane community to share with them the joy of learning and celebrate the ethos of Professor Myers. Throughout the years, we have had the privilege of hearing from leaders in the fields of medicine, science, politics, government and literature, and we are certain that tonight's speaker will be a worthy addition to this list. Professor Meyer's legacy still shapes the education and experiences of those lucky enough to study medicine at the University of Queensland. Indirectly through events such as this one and the use of the E.S. Meyer's Lecture Theatre over at Hurston, but also through the legacy carried on by family, friends, and the colleagues that knew him. We are very fortunate to remain in contact and have the support of the Myers family, many of whom are here tonight. We welcome you to this evening's lecture and acknowledge your ongoing contribution to our event, including through the creation of an endowment fund for the continuation of the lecture. We would also like to thank our major event sponsor, Avant Mutual, and platinum sponsors, Avant Mutual and Walsh's, without whom this event would not be possible. Each year, the E.S. Myers Memorial Lecture Orator selects a cause to support by donations. This year, our speaker has chosen to support the Hornsby Kurungai Women's Shelter, a not-for-profit organization that provides temporary supported accommodation to women in crisis, many of whom are victims of domestic violence and homelessness. In Australia, 16% of women have experienced domestic violence and tragically, one woman is killed every single week. We are currently in the midst of a homelessness crisis with women the most severely affected. The Hornsby Kurungai Women's Shelter aims to provide a safe and non-threatening environment to support women while they're undergoing emotional and physical crisis, as well as advocating for policy change at local, state and national levels. We are extremely pleased to be assisting Dr Roach in supporting this incredible cause and we will be accepting pay pass donations from attendees at the conclusion of this lecture. Now, to introduce tonight's speaker, we would now like to call upon the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Queensland, Professor Deborah Terry. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And thank you so much for your heartfelt acknowledgement, Chris. Can I too acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are meeting here tonight? We honour their elders and their continuing cultural and spiritual connection to this land as we walk together on the path to reconciliation. Now, Uni has done a great job of acknowledging all of our distinguished guests here uh, tonight, so I'm just going to acknowledge our guest speaker, Dr Vijay Roach. Thank you for agreeing to give this important lecture. Family and friends of Errol Solomon Myers, we're delighted to have you here tonight. UQ colleagues and students, distinguished guests, one and all. This lecture has been a mainstay of the university's calendar since it was established in 1957 to honour the huge contributions of Dr Errol Solomon Myers and his legacy as one of the founders of the UQ School of Medicine. Now, Uni and Rebecca have done a wonderful job of really going through all of that history and all that Dr Myers contributed, not only to the University of Queensland, but to our reputation as a university in this state, nationally and on the global stage. So I'm not going to go into those details uh, in, in more detail, but what I am going to just reflect on is the fact that sometimes history books are an unreliable prism for discerning a person's character and motivations. But by every account, Dr Myers was a man of great integrity and determination. Rather than focusing on the pursuit of fame and wealth, 
he brought the considerable strength of his personality to bear on the need to create opportunities for medical education and training in Queensland. This is reflected in comments made by the university following his passing in 1956, and I quote, his work was direct, practical, yet never losing the, the long view, the ideal. He might have been more famous and certainly have been more wealthy if he had lived more selfishly. He chose instead to devote himself to a cause and he found his reward in seeing it prosper. Generosity, selflessness and visionary thinking are traits that subsequent generations of the Myers family have all possessed. Many have attended UQ and many have followed in Errol's footsteps as doctors and medical professionals. And through the family's generosity, this memorial lecture has continued for more than 60 years. It has created a forum for noteworthy individuals to consider health, community and social justice through reflections on their own lives and achievements. And there have been many, many distinguished past speakers, including biologist Lord Robert Winston, cricketer and politician Imran Khan, Nobel laureate Professor Peter Doherty, author Lord Geoffrey Archer, and mountaineer and diplomat Sir Ed Edmund Hillary. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce to you our speaker, Dr VJ Roach. Dr Roach is a visiting medical officer in obstetrics and gynaecology in both public and private practice in Sydney. He's also former chairman of the Gidget Foundation, a not-for-profit organisation promoting the importance of emotional well-being among expectant and new parents. He's the current president of the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists, having previously served as chair of the New South Wales Training and Accreditation Committee, a position that he held for nine years. He is very committed to medical education and lectures at the University of Sydney. I have to say, as someone with a research and academic background in psychology, I'm particularly looking forward to Dr Roach's presentation. His topic, Mind Over Medicine, will delve into the issue of mental health in the medical profession, a really important topic, offering insights into the importance of introspection and self-awareness and dealing with imposter syndrome and validation, all based on his own experiences in the field. Would you please join me in welcoming Dr VJ Roach to the stage. Thank you very much. So we're here. I also would like to begin my talk by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land and all the land, lands, waters and communities across Australia. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for that beautiful intro introduction and for, for making us feel, because I think that's what's so important. I acknowledge their elders, past, present and emerging. And when I say acknowledgement of country, I mean it. This is Aboriginal land. It always was and it always will be. What happened 200 years ago is not okay. In many ways, we are not reconciled. The irony that my remit today is to talk about the mental health of medical students and doctors in 2021 is not lost on me when we think about the deep trauma and loss of generations of Aboriginal people, past, present and emerging. But there's also another loss in this story, and that is the opportunity that is lost to all of us. By failing to genuinely engage, we deny ourselves the opportunity to learn, to experience, to understand deep and profound truths and history, the connection with the land and with each other. We hold conferences on climate change, but we don't consult the people who manage the environment effectively for 40,000 years. We hand down a damning report on the aged care sector 
And the health minister says we should look overseas at how elders are treated in other countries. We don't need to look anywhere else. The answer has been here for 40,000 years. Elders, past, present and emerging. Aboriginal history is our history and our opportunity. So after that start, you're probably wondering where this is going to go. And when I received this invitation to speak, I realised that a terrible mistake had been made. And I don't know whether any of you have seen that Peter Sellers movie, The Party, where a bumbling Indian actor is accidentally put on the invitation list when he's supposed to go on the list that gets the sack. And I sort of feel like that guy. The last time I was invited to speak at a university, University of New South Wales, I asked them when they rang me, I said, did you mean to ask my dad, Neville Roach, AO, former chairman of Fujitsu, legend of the IT industry? They assured me, absolutely not. I spoke and the next year they invited my dad. <laughs> the bottom line is, is that I am deeply honoured and I'm genuinely chuffed to be here. I'm also honoured to follow all of those amazing speakers and one of them who's on the list is Professor Doug Saunders, who was a pioneer in IVF in Australia and a very close friend of mine and a mentor. So to stand in his shoes is really quite extraordinary. I've got so much that I want to share with you, so thank you for asking me to join you. I've also been reflecting on the legacy of Dr. Errol Mars, and I was lucky enough to meet some of his family and I hope to meet the rest later on. And he was a pioneer in professional health education in Queensland. We've heard his history, but the thing about him is I wondered what drove him. You know, 85 years later, we're remembering him as a visionary, but I just think that at the time, and I, maybe I, I created this image in my head, but he saw a need, he rolled up his sleeves, and he got it done. And I like to think that he saw value in young people, and he realised that the community needed doctors and dentists, and they needed to be trained to the highest standard. And I'm going to relate my position as the President of the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists to that thought process because that is the responsibility that we carry, that's the responsibility that the university carries, is to achieve that high standard to nurture young people. So the young man who asked me to speak is Uni. And I had the pleasure of having, and, and I think we should also mention Jeremy, Uni and Rebecca have been mentioned tonight. Jeremy has also been involved in organising this. And we met a couple of years at a student conference Whenever I speak to medical students, the way that I start my talk is I say, welcome to the family. And I ask you to think back to that day when you decided that you were going to study medicine. And you took a big deep breath and you went home and you told mum and dad, I've decided that I want to study medicine. And that's it. It's now revealed that that's what you want to do and they know. And their response was that they were so excited. And in fact, they called the whole family around for dinner to celebrate that Udi's going to become a doctor. And there you were, sitting next to your aunt at dinner, and she turned to you and she said, I've got this funny pain in my back, and, and I was wondering if you know what it is. And you realised that in that moment, you had crossed a threshold. You had joined a family. And we are a family. I accept that I'm a very old member of the family, and you are young members, Dr. Myers is an elder of our family. His vision and dedication is why we're here today. We are connected by a common desire to care, to heal and to support our patients. We sit apart in an interesting way from the rest of humanity because we've taken on that responsibility, a sacred duty. In return, we are gifted trust and intimacy which is a most extraordinary privilege. And I'm often overwhelmed by the value that is placed in me. The greatest gift that you can give any human being is to make them feel valued, and I receive that gift every day. But there's also a cost, and sometimes that's a terrible cost. A part of you shuts down, and in my case, I think eventually dies. You learn a kind of detachment a survival skill that separates you from others 
that a way, in a way that really only your colleagues can understand. And that's one of my messages to all of you. We are the same family. I'm an old eccentric uncle, but the main thing that separates us is only experience. I've just done it for longer. That's why I'm good at what I do. It's not a special gift, it's years of doing it. But I understand the traumas that you experience and you will get, learn an understanding of what I experience. It's also easier in many ways to be a specialist. We often hold specialists up to a, a higher standard. And we say, you know, when I was at university, I said, oh, you don't want to be just a GP. And I realised, interestingly, after many, many years, that my skill set has actually become so narrow that I've become brilliant in just one area, that my breadth and knowledge is nothing compared to a general practitioner. And they need to cover a far greater range, and I am actually just a specialist. So tonight, I thought I'd tell you a story. It's my story. It's a sort of rom-com, dramatic thriller. There's quite a few boring bits. And there's a dashing hero and a beautiful heroine. It's deeply personal. I also want to share with you my thoughts on leadership in medicine, the opportunities and the pitfalls. And finally, I want to talk about you, the real you, not a sanitised, idealised version and what my hopes are for your future. As the story unfolds, I hope that you will see that the central theme of Mind Over Medicine is inseparable from the story or from our lives. As I wrote and rewrote this speech, I realised that some of the messages are going to seem contradictory, maybe a bit confusing, and then I tried to tidy that up. I tried to make it all follow in some logical way. But then I thought, actually, there is very little clarity in this whole discussion. And so, if I leave you a little bit confused or with more questions than answers, then I have succeeded in taking you into the mess that is my mind. <laughs> I'm an ordinary clinician. I'm not a bad one, but I don't make any claims of clinical or surgical brilliance. My children assure me that I'm not a particularly good father, and my wife tells me that she married me because she was old and desperate. <laughs> I'm not saying this to sound uh, some sort of false modesty. It's simply because when it comes to medical care, our patient actually has no ability to make a judgment. She has no hope of knowing. The patient thinks that because she saw you on 60 Minutes, you must be a brilliant doctor. That was when I walked into another patient the next day and she said, stop, I want a real doctor, not a TV actor to operate on me. Or my other patient who rang that, uh, a friend and said, we saw your doctor on television the other day. He's not that special. Every patient tells a story and what I've discovered is that as a very powerful doctor, I have often failed to listen to that story. I have become conceited in my belief that I know what's best. So tonight, I want to share with you a very personal story and the way that the journey has impacted my life and my practice of medicine. I'm going to tell you a love story. It's a story of a dashing young man and a beautiful woman. It's a funny story. It does have romance and pathos and terrible tragedy and luckily a happy ending. The main character is a heroine, an inspiring woman with extraordinary qualities, a person who, wants, who, who makes me want to be a better man. I want to connect my story, our story, with the fact that all women matter. And if we understand that, humanity is going to be a lot better off. So when I was 21, I met a girl. Actually, she was a woman, six years older than me. I was a medical student too, usually drunk, failing all of my exams. I was a real catch. We met, on, we met at a party and she'd stepped on some glass and while I sat next to her, pulling the pieces of glass out of her foot, which was my first surgical procedure, we fell in love. And three years later we were married. I was only 24. Now, one of the most complicated things about being an obstetrician and gynaecologist is contraception. 
The other thing that complicated our marriage was that she just couldn't get enough of me. And so one thing led to another, and the first of our three unplanned pregnancies occurred. Kathy had a very strong perception of what she wanted in that pregnancy. She wanted whale music and a water birth, and I don't say that dismissively. She wanted to engage with pregnancy and the whole experience. She ended up with medicine, preeclampsia, and forceps. The doctors and the midwives were brilliant, and we reflect on the fact that they saved her life and saved our son's life. But at no point in time did anybody ask her how she felt. At that time, she was a successful manager with the New South Wales Tourism Commission. She loved her work and her career. But by some time in the pregnancy, at about 32 weeks, she was admitted to hospital, medicated and ordered to stop work. I thought that was pretty reasonable. After all, she had a medical condition and what do you want out of a pregnancy? You want a healthy baby and a healthy mother. But then Kathy's losses multiplied. Gone was the birth centre. Instead, it was replaced with induction, with prostaglandins, which led to tonic severe pain and an epidural that she didn't want. Her blood pressure went up and she lost her eyesight. The doctor rushed in and did a difficult forceps delivery. And finally, a beautiful boy was born to two very deeply traumatised parents. Breastfeeding didn't work, of course. I went back to work, of course. Our life fell apart, of course. The sad part was that we thought it was normal. We thought that mothers got tired and anxious and then decompensated, that your relationship became distant and then hostile and then totally dysfunctional. We also knew how to put on a mask and fool everyone, I remember. We would have dinner parties and everyone would laugh and drink and talk and there'd be plenty of food and then we would close the door and the fighting would begin again. So in typically sensitive fashion, my solution to the problem was to have sex, which we did, and Kathy turned up for a six-week visit and she was pregnant again. Now, I know what you're all thinking, how irresponsible, but I want you to be more understanding. Kathy is only human. <laughs> the world collapsed completely after the birth of our second son. I found out many years later that after, when, when I'd leave for work, Kathy would grab my shirt and hold me, not wanting me to go to work. And I would pull away and I'd go to work. And I found out that what she would do would be to put our little boys in their cots and then she would go and sit on the kitchen floor and rock herself, paralysed by anxiety, feeling isolated and lonely. I found out that Kathy suffered this person, who was the most important person in my universe, suffered suicidal thoughts for two years. And finally, by chance, a friend suggested postnatal depression. Kathy was admitted to hospital. She was medicated. She was counselled. She was asked about her relationship with her mother, but none of that worked. Eventually, we found a marriage counsellor, and together we struggled back. Kathy's illness was not her fault. Indeed, the biological aspect of mental illness is never anyone's fault. Science doesn't have an answer yet, but the thing that we really need to talk about, and I think the thing that underpins the conversation about perinatal anxiety and depression, is the expectation that being born female creates. From the beginning, girls are characterised as pretty and good and then the expectations begin. Young women are told how to behave, encouraged to get an education, then encouraged to wed and then breed. Control over their bodies is not allowed. If they are pregnant, they must continue it. They must not drink, they should not lift. They must have this test. They must see that midwife or that doctor. And of course, they will only succeed if they birth vaginally without pain relief or intervention and they must, but on the other hand, they should accept any kind of treatment if it's safer for their baby. Baby's most important. They must breastfeed. They must then stop work and cater for the every need of their growing child because the only primary carer is a woman. No wonder she's anxious. 
No wonder she feels that she's a failure. The other part of our story is what happens to a partner when a new mother's world comes crashing down. In my world, Kathy was and remains my rock. I rely on her for advice, for comfort, for reassurance and for validation. Even today, there isn't another person who can provide that for me. And 28 years ago, that rock crumbled and whichever way I tried to, I couldn't put it back together again. We have a contrasting view of men in our society. We often perceive them negatively, angry, always about sex, violent, emotionally distant, that we don't talk, that we're unclean. And in that context, I could be loving and caring, I could be whining and emotional, I could be angry and abusive, and Kathy would cry, but how do you comfort someone for two reasons? One, when she cannot hear you, and two, when you're experiencing your own pain. And the other emotion that came out in perinatal anxiety and depression was anger. While Kathy's sadness and her vulnerability distressed me, the anger that perinatal anxiety and depression created affected me deeply then, and it still affects me today, because I was the reason for her pain. I was a doctor, and I saw things the way that doctors do. She had experienced a traumatic birth, stopping work, being alone at home. I couldn't do it at the time, but if you'd looked at the world from Kathy's perspective, I cared more about my patients. She felt that I was abandoning my children and abandoning her. And I accept that a lot of that was true. I hadn't respected her feelings about pregnancy, and I hadn't recognised that the world was crumbling around her. And so with those accusations came blame, and the first reaction that anybody has to blame is denial and anger in return, and there was plenty of that. Then came guilt and remorse and fear, fear that this was all going to end very, very badly. Because I would react and we would fight and another opportunity to be happy would be lost forever. And what I really want to be clear, particularly with this introduction, having the opportunity to be this orator, the kind and nice things that are said, is that I don't want to stand up here and pretend that I was some kind of saint. I was and I remain a flawed human. And so I want to present this story very honestly. I don't know how we worked it out or what happened or why I stayed, oh, sorry, or how I stayed, but I do know why, because that emotion was then and it still is now. And I think that it was very simply love. There is no other person in my life that consumes my heart more than my wife. I understand that sort of concept of doves pairing for life. I understand why older men die soon after their partners do. I understand the concept of loneliness that divorce can bring. As health professionals, we very rarely use those emotive words. We're scared that it might blunt our professionalism, but I don't think we need to be afraid because sometimes our patients need us to reach out and to be human. All those years ago, nobody asked me how I felt. I was in so much pain, I took on so much blame, I felt that it was my fault and the only human being in the world who could save me had nothing left to give. That wasn't her fault, she was ill. I recognised that and I was sad for her. I was never diagnosed with anxiety and depression but probably nobody ever asked. Perinatal anxiety and depression is absolutely about women but it's important to remember that men can experience it too and can be very damaged. So what do obstetricians do? Most women will tell you not very much. But what we do get to do is that we get to share the story. We are part of that experience, part of that journey with parents, the excitement of pregnancy, the pain of miscarriage and stillbirth, the fear and exhilaration of childbirth and the joy of becoming a parent. There's a story that gave me an insight into why women might experience pregnancy and the mothering the way that they do. Imagine, or no, think to the island nation of Vanuatu. Now, on that island nation, there are no uh, fully qualified anaesthetists. 
And there was a little boy and he presented with Guillain-Barre syndrome. And for those of you who don't know, it's an illness where the lungs become paralyzed by infection and you need a machine to help you breathe. There isn't a ventilator in Vanuatu. So the parents were told to take their little boy home because he would die. So they took him home to the village and for every minute of every hour of every day for more than a week, the villagers took it in turn to squeeze air through a bag and a mask to keep that boy alive. They couldn't stop. It didn't matter if they were tired, if they were hungry, if they needed to go to the toilet or if they just wanted to give up. They just couldn't. And that little boy lived. That is being a mother. That is being a parent. You can never stop. You can never walk away and every action has a consequence. But we need to remind ourselves constantly that a mother is a person. A woman is a person. As men, we're recognised as a doctor, an engineer, a football player. We acknowledge that men have many facets to their lives, but our expectation of women is that they should be mothers or wives or dutiful daughters or sex objects. We tell women what to do, and for the most part, they acquiesce. So what can I learn from this as a clinician? I have learned, and I continue to learn, to listen. I'm learning not to give advice. I'm learning that my power as a doctor is so enormous that even with the best of intentions, I can do incredible good, but I can also do incredible harm. There's that ex well-known expression that if you, how, how quickly does a doctor interrupt a patient in a consultation? And the answer is within 20 seconds. And I thought, oh, that's not me. You know, I'm such a good doctor and I listen all the time. And a patient comes in and she says, I've been having, and I said, why are you here? And she says, oh, well, I've been having periods. And she pretty much had heavy periods. And before she'd even finished a sentence, I was in taking a bang, bang, bang history because I knew what was wrong. I knew what she needed and I knew how to treat it. And she wrote to me when she never came back again. And she said, I thought you're a fantastic doctor. I thought your knowledge was incredible, but I didn't feel that you were listening to me. There's another thing that I was thinking about with this lecture is that there's nothing good about getting old. But the thing that I'm really enjoying about getting old is that I enjoy admiring others. I finally left my ego at home and I can look out at all of you and admire you, but I can look at my patient and realise that everything's in her and that it isn't in me. So as a now a senior clinician, I've got a message for all health professionals. Even when you save a life, patients actually don't want drugs. They don't want brilliant surgeons. They, they need competence and they need to be able to assume competence, but having assumed competence, the next thing that they want is they want love and they want humanity. Now our story has a happy ending. We had three more babies. I'll tell you quickly about one of them who was born in Hong Kong. He was conceived with a very drunk sperm, so things had not improved in that department. And Kathy began labouring in the middle of the night, but she kept quiet because she wanted to have a home birth and she didn't want to tell me. But I did wake up and so I dragged her out of the apartment and there we were in the car park trying to get to a hospital that was an hour away. And I turned around, it was pitch black. And the only people in the car park are two Chinese guards who do not speak any English. And I'm saying, be quiet, be quiet. And then I heard that sound. And now many of you who have um, either experienced birth yourself or witnessed it will know this sound, which is, Ugh. and I did. And this is very important for the medical students and any other people who are caught in this situation is I did what any sensible person would do, which is that I examined Kathy across the bonnet of the car and discovered that there was a head there. So I threw her in the car and uh, she talks about the fact that she was convinced that she would deliver the baby in the glove box. And when she backed out of the car, there was a very unsuspecting man standing there who got a view that he'll never forget. And we put her on the trolley and she nearly delivered in the lift. Welcome to the world, Hugo. It did have a happy ending and we have five beautiful children. But we made a decision, and it was Kathy's decision, that she wanted to use her story to reach out to those in need. 
she chose to display her vulnerability in a very public way. Never underestimate how difficult it is for a survivor to tell their story. But Cathy and I were determined that we would not stop our work while we knew that there, was, there were men and women who were out there and suffering alone. It wasn't just chance that led us to Gidget's family. Gidget was a real person. She was a young mother with a loving husband, family and friends. They welcomed their baby girl into the world 14 years ago. It's now 18 years ago, 20. So much joy, so much hope and so much love. But Gidget was lost, sad and anxious, feeling alone, despite this loving and caring family. They were always there for her, but she took her own life because she could see no other way. Well, Gidget's family were not going to stand by and let that happen to someone else. And so, and then Kathy and I worked with them to establish a registered charity. We introduced screening into private hospitals. We opened a house to provide free psychological services. And Kathy had the pre-COVID insight to recognise that healthcare, psychological healthcare, could be delivered by telehealth. So any man or woman in Australia suffering from perinatal mental illness can receive that telehealth. While we were there, the chairman, the CEO and the board, the committee were all unpaid volunteers. We received no government funding and we raised our money through lunches. My favourite lunch was the ladies' lunch, which was 1,000 women and me. I also spoke at men's lunch and what we'd do is we'd lure these unsuspecting men into the pub with a promise of a beer and a steak and some footy and then we'd tell them about perinatal mental health. Kathy was the CEO for nine years and she dedicated herself to the cause, channeling her survivor's guilt into something purposeful. I also had the opportunity to join the review of Medicare and Australia is now the first and only country in the world where screening for in pregnancy for drug and alcohol misuse, domestic violence and perinatal mental health is embedded in the national legislation as a compulsory mandatory thing to do in pregnancy. Kathy and I are no longer associated with the organisation. Not-for-profits are very complex entities. But we can look back at a time well spent. We helped to change that paradigm of perinatal mental health. Kathy is now on the board of the Hornsby Karingai Women's Shelter, which provides refuge for, for victims of domestic violence. This is my charity of choice. And I think I, I remember the moment. You know, there are so many issues in the world. There's so many things that we could talk about. There, you, you, you can go mad worrying about all the things that there are to worry about and that we should be doing something about. And it's interesting the things that just never really crossed your radar that you hadn't actually paused and thought about. And I don't think I had really given a lot of thought to domestic violence. And there we were at a, at a um, fundraising event. And this woman got up and she talked about her experience. She talked about the fear that she felt living at home. She talked about being beaten and how she had escaped with her children and nothing else and had to find somewhere to stay. And it went just straight through me. And, and I realised that these are women... In, that in the same way that we stood up for women with mental illness, we would now stand up for victims of domestic violence and we will not watch them suffer. So I want to change tact a little bit and having shared a bit of my personal life, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about how I arrived on this stage. It wasn't a particularly auspicious start. For all of you students, when I was at uni, I failed 50% of my exams. I got 54% in obstetrics and now I'm president of the college. <laughs> I was voted least likely to succeed. My friends used to have bets on whether I'd passed or failed. So when I finally somehow, I don't know, qualified, I, I said to my children, you should be studying much harder and you should, and then I said, and I went to the cabinet and pulled out my university's transcript and it had all these conceited passes. <laughs> and I thought, no, never mind. You just go and do whatever it is that you've got to do. Anyway, I became an intern. And my first shift was at a small suburban hospital. And in those days, there's no 
tech, uh, textbook on your phone. There's no Dr. Google. And so when you thought that you had a diagnosis, you take a history, do a bit of an examination, we go into a little room and we go through all the books trying to work out what was wrong with the patient. So I saw this woman in the middle of the night, two o'clock in the morning, and she comes in, she's got a blinding headache and she's photophobic and she's got neck stiffness. And I examined her and I went in and I looked at the books and suddenly there it was, right there in front of her. And I went back and I said, excuse me, but have you had sex tonight? There could be a common theme in what I've been saying. I know, but, and she said, yes. And so, and I said, and did you have an orgasm? And she said, yes. And I confidently explained to her that she had a benign orgasmic headache. And having looked at it up, up in the books, I gave her the analgesics and she got better and I sent her home. Legend. And so I realised that this was a future that was in front of me. It was something that I obviously knew a lot about. A week later, a woman comes in in the middle of the night with a headache, photophobia and neck stiffness. Out of the way because, you know, the expert is here. And so I pushed them aside and I went and diagnosed a benign orgasmic headache and I treated her. The next day, when the helicopter flew her out because of her subarachnoid hemorrhage, I realised that I still had quite a lot to learn. I was very fortunate because I found the, I had the opportunity to work in obstetrics and I found my passion. This was something that I loved, something that I was good at. And looking back now, I realised that what I love then and what I still love now is connecting with people. That's where I get value. I studied medicine because I wanted to save the world and I saw that medicine seemed to be the most powerful vehicle. I'm a relational person rather than a transactional one. What does that mean? For me, what that means is that when you're flying Qantas and you're squeezed in there in your economy seat and the steward comes along and he hands you your coffee and he looks you in the eye and uh, gives a, sm a, a smile and in, some, in that moment, there's a connection. The alternative is just to hand you your coffee like that. And relational is deciding that actually I want to feel a sense of connection with another human being. I've realised that as a doctor, I'm a superhero. That doesn't mean I wear my underpants on the outside, but I do have superpowers. I've discovered that if I smile at someone and if I listen, I can make their whole day better. How cool is that? So I go around smiling at people, which you know creates different responses. Some run away. So back to being an ONG resident, that was, here I was now, most likely to succeed. But true to form, I failed the exam. And so I was shown the door of that hospital and found another job at another hospital as a first year registrar in obstetrics and gynaecology. And then it started, then I hit my stride, then I knew what I was doing. We worked 100 hours a day in, in 100 hours a week in those days. And I know that there's all the reasons to discuss why that isn't appropriate now. But in those days, I loved it. I passed my part one exam. I kept succeeding. I became the youngest to pass my part two exam. I became the youngest senior registrar, the youngest consultant in my cohort. And I opened a private practice on the North Shore of Sydney and within a year I had to close my books. I was the flavor of the month, the guy, the obstetrician to the rich and famous and to the private school elite of Sydney. Husbands would donate a kidney so that I would look after their wife. I was a legend. And then it all fell apart. The relentless hours, the being on call all the time, never unwinding, the hero who couldn't afford to let anyone down. One of my uni friends had said to me, obstetricians are just men. In those days, they were all just men, are just men who need to be needed. But the cost of being that need is that you can never walk away. So I decided to walk away. I'd close the practice, I would quietly retire, and I would never return again. I'd achieved everything that needed to be achieved. But instead we made a decision and instead of closing the practice, I got in a locum and Kathy and I and our five little children got on a plane and we flew out and we flew out and traveled around the world for four months. I remember when we got to the airport and I said to the children, there was a red line in the carpet and I said, I want you all to line up on that carpet and Kathy included and the seven of us stood there and then I said, I want you to take a step. And we took a step and I said, Dada is now free.
because we were going to leave all of that behind and I was going to be there with them. And we saw friends and we visited sites and we enjoyed being together and there was a lovely freedom and escape from the world. It wasn't like some kind of movie. And it wasn't as though when it was time I was ready to go back to work, but I think what I then accepted in those four months was that work was a part of my life and that what I needed to do was to try not to escape but to learn to integrate work with life. I don't like the term work-life balance because it implies that life's better than work. That doesn't need to be the case. I love my work, but I need to work out how to integrate those two things. So I took more weekends off. We had more holidays. I was more present when I wasn't at work, looking at the so many things that there were to enjoy. One of the wonderful forms of escapism was going to the opera, something I hadn't discovered before. And I'd love how the, the, the music and, and the story would, would fill me with deep emotion. Every young person, and many who are older, dream of success. You want to be the guy on the stage. You want to be the CEO or the president. You want to be a famous doctor or a lawyer or a movie star. But success can sometimes have a very heavy price. My pathway has been extraordinary. I did well at school and then despite partying all the time, I managed to get through university and I loved those days. I got jobs and maybe with some sort of natural talent, and enthusiasm and ability to get on with people, I progressed through the system. I found a profession that I loved and I was good at and I established a good practice. I never had to worry about money. I met someone I loved and I could share life with and success just seemed to beget success. Soon after I qualified, I was called by the then president of our college and asked to take over a job because very sadly the colleague who was doing the job had died in a light plane crash. And I became chair of training and accreditation for the Royal Australian College at the time in New South Wales. That that meant being responsible for 100 trainees, signing their forms every three months, going to the meetings, counselling them if things went wrong. I got involved in medical student teaching. I was a training supervisor in obstetrics and gynaecology. I became head of department at the hospital. I published multiple papers. I was the name in private obstetrics on the North Shore of Sydney, the biggest fish in a reasonable sized pond. I then got invited to nominate for the council of the college and I was immediately elected. Then they put my hand on my shoulder, they put a hand on my shoulder and said, we think you should nominate for the board, which I did for six years. I had a wonderful time then. I loved being the second in charge. And then I was elected president. And it doesn't seem to end. There's uh, 15 medical colleges across Australia and New Zealand and a month ago I was elected the chair of the Council of the Presidents of Medical Colleges. And I feel very proud to have that opportunity. But I've been reflecting on my thoughts about success, which is, in fact, I'm not sure that's exactly what I want. But then I wonder, am I actually really ambitious? Am I arrogant and I want to tell everyone to do, what to do? How do I want to be in charge? You know, when you see politicians, we always think the worst of them. We assume that they only act out of self-interest. I wonder if that's unfair. Do any of us do anything differently? Whatever underlies the reasons for my success, I know that I have paid a price. When I think of my dream house, it's a lighthouse, isolated from the world. I keep asking Cathy to live on a deserted island with me, but she's smarter than that. The cost of success and our profession is weariness. The constant hypervigilance, the sense of scrutiny, the fear of failure, the knowledge that each step we balance precariously on the precipice of disaster. There's also a very fine line between altruism and resentment. Of course we should care for the most vulnerable. But what about our own needs? Of course I should care about my elderly parents, my patients, the colleague who is struggling with work, my child who is struggling with university, the latest victim on the news. But I've got nothing left. My tank is empty. I want to be left alone and I want everybody else to get on with it. Be careful what you wish for. Because I think what I'm arriving at is that what I actually want is I want to be ordinary. 
More and more, I am less comfortable with the construct of success and achievement. I prefer a simple conversation. Last night, Uni and Jeremy and, and Kathy and I went out to dinner and we just sat and had a nice meal and talked about things. That was what I wanted to do. I think that we promote this concept of excellent achievement and being on the front page of the newspaper and isn't he amazing or isn't she the most extraordinary leader when in fact, what I think we crave is ordinariness. I don't want to win. It actually makes me feel ill and I know the two occasions on which we had nominations for president and then nominations for chair of CPMC, I didn't want to win and I won because the reason I didn't want to win isn't, it wasn't because I didn't want the job but because I felt sick about the other person. I remember when we sold our house and we sold it for a ridiculously high price and the only thought that went through my mind and I needed absolute reassurance was that the person who bought it had enough money to buy it because I didn't want to think about him being overstretched and unable to maintain the payments. Another cost of success and leadership is loneliness. Leadership positions create a barrier because there's an unequal power relationship. The teacher, student, the employer, employee, the senior person, the junior person. We were talking earlier about, you know, please call me by my first name, but for the student, that's a very difficult thing to do. When the boss says, you know, relax and enjoy yourself at a, at a Christmas function, there's a limit to how much you can relax because of that unequal power relationship. I'm always disappointed when I go to a function and I get seated at the main ta table. But I also feel a little sad when I'm talking to someone and I sense that hesitancy because of my position. I want to convince them that I'm a regular guy, but we form these constructs in our mind and we find it hard to believe. At public functions, I actually often find myself standing alone because people think they shouldn't trouble me and nothing could be further from the truth. So the third part of my talk is about mental illness in medical professionals, which we know is extremely high. Suicide rates are very high. And yet we have a perception of ourselves as different. I'm wondering, just looking at this room, whether anybody has a perfectionist personality? Does anybody get anxious or feel down? Okay, I'll go first. The truth is, is that I have terrible imposter syndrome. I have agonised and agonised over this speech. I've looked for ways to avoid it. I sort of partly hoped that maybe the borders would be closed and it would be cancelled and I wouldn't have to turn up and be humiliated in front of you. I also worry when I'm at work. If I have a complication in surgery, I'm convinced that if another surgeon had done the procedure, they would have done a better job and the complication wouldn't have occurred. When I turn up to see a patient after an operation, I always have this sort of faint surprise that they're so well and that they've recovered well. And when I get thanked, I feel embarrassed. And yet I also know that I'm grateful for the reassurance. I haven't been able to shake off that feeling that in some way I'm not worthy. And so that becomes a bit of a burden. I also realise that I can become extremely anxious and worry about what people think about me. I'm worried I'll let people down. You've got to remember that the most important principle about anxiety is that it's irrational and it's personal. So anxiety is when you worry about the dumb things, not about when you worry about a real situation. The other thing about an anxious person is it doesn't make them universally anxious. My anxiety manifests as me worrying all weekend about my Monday morning operating list and whether it will run on time. And if it doesn't run on time, whether I'll be late for the clinic and there'll be this knock-on effect. And I worry about that every weekend and I've been doing this for 25 years and every Monday's come and every Monday's gone. And I waste all that time and energy thinking about it. How dumb is that? On the other hand, if I have someone who's bleeding to death, I'm just bored. And I'm thinking, oh, well, we'll just stop the bleeding to death and then we can all go home. And my heart rate doesn't go up at all. I actually have this thing that when you're in a critical situation and you've really got to concentrate, the image that comes to my mind, and this might surprise you, is American Sniper. Because I think, and I try to slow my breathing down and I imagine my heart rate coming down. And there I am cool in that situation. Possibly not the best analogy, but it, it works for me. Remember, never run in an emergency.
The thing is that we're not different from our patients. And it's really important to get that concept into your head. The medical profession sees itself as separate. And I acknowledged at the beginning of the talk how we're separated from the community in a lot of ways. But I think that understanding ourselves and realising that we have the same vulnerabilities as our patients, the people who we care for, is we can learn a lot and we can achieve a lot. It's not about humility. That's a whole different subject. And, and as an aside, I actually don't have time for people who aren't humble. Be humble. You know, if you need to be better than everybody else, then I'm very pleased for you, but I don't need to be part of your scene. If you're successful, you don't need to announce it when you walk in the room. In fact, I reckon the ultimate achievement of a successful person is that no one knows their name. That doesn't detract from the fact that taking pleasure in your success is also a good thing. That's not wrong. Enjoying the recognition of others is normal. Feeling good about yourself is healthy. I'm not trying to portray myself as some sort of virtuous, altruistic, selfless Gandhian figure. And on that note, I'm not really trying to impart some kind of wisdom. What I hope that I'm doing is sharing my journey and giving you an unsanitized version, not a Photoshop one. The best thing about realizing that you're not the most important person in the world is that it's extraordinarily liberating. When you realise that the world will turn without you, that somebody else can do your job, that you don't need to be in charge, that others are equally capable, it means you can step off the roller coaster for a while and you can empower others to succeed. Because the cost of, step, of not stepping off is too high. The cost of not stepping off is not enjoying your family or your friends or yourself. It happened to me. When my older son was 15 years old, our relationship had become so dysfunctional that I had decided it was like a movie where you had the father and the son and they had no relationship at all. Until eventually I decided that wasn't acceptable and Cathy persuaded me and we went to see a counsellor. And we walked in to see the counsellor and I said to the counsellor, I'm VJ Roach, I'm an obstetrician, I'm a legend, everybody loves me and uh, I've got this kid and he's got all of these problems. And she looked at me and she said, uh, actually, I think you could be the one with the problem. So I was quite taken aback because no one had actually said that to me before. And I thought, I'm the person who everybody says is incredible. I thought this woman's got it all wrong. But I sat down and I listened and she talked and she explained to me the way that I talked to my son. And she talked to me about the way that I related to my family. And we went home and we sat down with our five children and I told them what that lady said. And they looked at me and they said, yes, that's true. And I had to make a choice in that moment. Was it more important to maintain my sense of self, to defend my position, to say I'm the father and I'm the authority, or would I stop, leave my ego outside the door and try to have a relationship with my children? Well, I chose the latter. And we sat down and we talked about our personalities and the way that we interacted and whether we listened to one another or not. And I apologised to my son and I started to listen. And I now have the most extraordinary relationship with my children. I shared with them my anxieties about this talk. And the text all day today of reassurance to say, it'll be okay, you'll be fine, you can do it. It's not just about love, it's about friendship, it's about mutual respect. And I think we're very lucky as this generation, the relationship that we have with our children. But what I learned was that if you don't listen, you don't hear. And if you don't hear, then you miss out. And if you don't listen, you don't show respect to the other person who's speaking to you. And each human, be it your child, a student, that older colleague, women, people of different ethnicities, the patient who walks in the door, they all have inherent value. Every human has inherent value. And that raises another thought that I had, is that if a person was looking at Earth from outer space, they would think that a human was a white Anglo-Saxon heterosexual male. They would think that that was normal, that that was the default. And they would hear things like, you're a bit different different from the norm. 
You hear expressions like, you speak English very well, or she's not that dark, or no one thinks of you as Indian. He's flamboyant, but he isn't gay. Or she's Chinese, but she's just like one of us. And we have to pause and think how offensive that is. But this isn't a lecture to the dominant culture saying you're bad and you should change. It's more to the people who are of different ethnicities, to white Anglo-Saxon, remembering that white Anglo-Saxon is also, um, or you know, being English or, or Swedish is also an ethnicity, that whatever your race or your colour or religion or sexuality, I want you to know and say to yourself, I am who I am and that has inherent value. Not relative value, inherent value. Every human has an incredible story to tell you if you'll only listen. And once you stop to listen, the pressure falls away. You don't have to talk and you don't have to say the right things and you don't have to get it right. You don't have to be the leader all the time. And I love the fact that I've arrived in my life where I wander around admiring other people. I love the fact that I don't have to be the guy anymore. I can sit back and look at someone and think, gee, you're cool. I can celebrate your success rather than concentrating on my own. So I want to finish up, and it's a great way of, I, I read somewhere that that's the best way to get an audience's attention just as they've fallen asleep. You sort of say expressions like in conclusion. So since I've got your attention, I have two stories. The first is that I've talked about the need to take the pressure off yourself, but the reality is that the doctors don't do that. Linked to that is the sea of people who need our help. There's a massive clinic, all the socioeconomic groups, whole populations. When Cathy talks about homeless women and victims of domestic violence, people who got up in the morning to do no one harm who suffer, I'm overwhelmed by the enormity of the problem, almost panicked. So I want you to imagine a beach, which isn't hard to do in Queensland, and there's a massive storm and hundreds of thousands of starfish have been washed up onto the beach. An old man who is tired and cynical is walking on the beach and comes across a little boy who's picking up the starfish and throwing them back into the ocean. He says to the little boy in an irritated voice, what's the point? There are too many starfish. It's not going to make any difference. And the little boy bends down and he picks up a starfish and he throws it back in the water and he says, well, it made a difference to that one. So what I want you to think about is this very ordinary couple who you met today and the terrible suffering that we experienced. Think about the fact that if someone had asked and someone had listened, we might not have experienced such pain. The person who sits in front of you as a clinician who's sitting next to you now is your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your friend. They're not another. And the other thing is that too often we underestimate the enormous power that we have to have a gentle touch, to just smile, to say a kind word, be a listening ear or to give an honest compliment because even that small act of kindness will can turn a life around and that's the power that we have. The second is a message about self-care. And it comes from a story given by the former CEO of Coca-Cola. And he said, imagine life as a game where you're juggling five balls in the air. And those balls are work and family, health and friends and your spirit. And you're trying to keep them all up there. But when you look a little bit more closely, you realise that some of those balls are made of rubber and some of them are made of glass. Some of them, if you drop them, will bounce. Some of them, if you drop them, will crack or splinter or shatter forever. They will never be the same. Trying to work out what the relative value is of all the things that we have in our life is not some clear algorithm, but it's something to challenge ourselves with. The last message is this. What I really want for every one of you is to forget the guy on the stage. I don't want you to remember my name and I don't want you to remember what I said. My children live by two rules. 
The first is be happy. The second is that you get out of bed in the morning to care about another human being. We've all got a choice during our limited time on the planet. We can just survive, we can live an ordinary life, or we can reach out and we can talk to each other, we can care for each other, and we can live an extraordinary life. Who I am, or what I may or may not have achieved, is irrelevant. Because each of you has that power. Each of you can care, you can love, each of you is valued, and you are all that you need to be. The privilege of standing and giving this oration has been mine. You've given me the opportunity to share this evening with you. My life is richer because you are in it. So thank you. So I suppose I want to take you back. You're 21. You're at that party. You're picking bits of glass out of Kathy's feet. What would you tell that medical student at that party, um, having sort of been on this amazing journey? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. I, I think I can answer that question by thinking to my 30th birthday party. And my mother had said that she wanted to organise a, a birthday party and I'd, I'd been quite annoyed and said that I didn't want one and then realised that that was something that was important to her. And I stood in front of my family, my aunts and my uncles, and I said, a realisation has come to me when I reflect back on my youth. And, and, I, I kept, and, and it's interesting, maybe you'll be able to help me with this, but is I often, when I reflect back, I reflect back negatively on myself. I don't reflect back on good things that I did. I I'll often... Um, reflect back on mistakes that I made or times when I lost my temper or, or times when I hurt somebody. But I said, at this point in my life when I'm 30, I actually want to look back to that 21-year-old mm. and be gentle and be forgiving of that person and to realise that that was who you were in that moment. And, and that's okay. You could only have just been that person in that moment. And I have this thing that what with the, the other thing about getting old is maturity. And I am more mature now than I was five years ago. And I hope to be more mature in five years again. So it's a journey, that it's a sort of continuum that, that it keeps on going. And it's all right to have been who you were at that time. Just accept it. Yeah. One of the things that intrigued me uh, when you were talking tonight was the house you and Kathy would like to live in, or the house that you said you'd like to live in, that sort of lighthouse. And I think what intrigued me about that was you explained it in terms of wanting to be isolated and wanting to be alone. But the other thing that struck me from that image is that lighthouses sort of send that beam of light to protect others from hitting the rocks. Uh, and you talked about the sea of people, the sea of patience. Um, so, what is it uh, about you that on the one hand uh, seeks sort of isolation, but on the other hand wants to protect others? The thing is, is that the, the biggest limitation is in trying to explain these very complex... Even as I was giving that speech, I thought, am I actually communicating what I want to communicate? You know, are these words adequate enough? And... We, we use terms like altruism or working for others or looking after others. I don't know why. I, it, it's just this thing that I sort of feel that that's what you do, that you get up in the morning and you, you look around you and you think, what, what can I do for that person? And, and I think we've characterised that all wrong as sort of being a good person. I don't think it's necessarily good. I think it's just what it is. But... So all you've got to do is just move a tiny bit and you can have a deep resentment of it as well. I don't want to be that person anymore. I don't want to feel that I've got to have made tonight a good night. I don't want to feel that that person had a good time at the party. I don't want to walk in and take on that responsibility, which is then where you take the next step, which is where you actually say, stop, be very, very careful that you don't see yourself as the superhero on whom 
the entire world depends. Just accept that, you, that this is a feeling that you want to do and this is a burden that nobody else is imposing on you. They're not asking you to do this. You're actually choosing to do this. And I think that's very important when you do something altruistic or you do something for someone else is it's not them making you do it. It's a choice that you make. So that, that light lets me see, hmm. the, the light from the lighthouse lets me see all of those people, but being in the lighthouse allows me to retreat from them um, and, and, and shield myself off. My, my other lighthouse is an aeroplane. So in the first year of my presidency, we uh, took 100, I took 100 flights all over Australia, New Zealand, the world, and I love getting on a plane because you get on a plane and the doors close and your phone doesn't work and you're in this isolation. But the isolation, again, and I, I'm sure, I actually think I'm revealing some really deep pathologies here, but <laughs> the, the isolation means that I don't feel any guilt because I can't answer my phone. I can't go and help. Even this morning, there's an email um, with someone who says, I'm having terrible bleeding and what should I do? And then there's a part of my thought process was, I've got to sort this out and I've got to make sure she's there. And then the other was this relief that actually I can't do anything about it because I'm in Brisbane and she's in Sydney. And so being in a plane or being in a lighthouse gives me an excuse not to have to do that. It sort of gives you that permission. Permission, yeah. So we have a number of questions from members of our audience. And I think the first one I want to sort of ask you about is, did you hesitate about presenting any of the personal topics tonight? Not tonight, because we have been speaking about these stories for quite a while now. But I do remember the first time that Cathy chose to, to talk. Chose in a sense for us to talk about it, but I actually gave the first major speech but with her permission. And, or, and, and, and in fact, because Cathy needs to point out that you cannot wear a Hawaiian shirt tonight, that you have to wear a suit, <laughs> that um, I said, listen, I think I'll just ad lib the talk. It's an oration and you're going to write it properly. And also when it came and I had to give this keynote speech on perinatal mental health, she had made a whole series of notes for me. And I thought that these were notes that she intended for me to, to put into the speech. Now, at the time, she hadn't absolutely intended for me to do that, but I did it. And I remember feeling shattered at the end of it, and Cathy was shattered. And in fact, both of us, even all these years later, still, when you stand up there and you say it, and you share it, um, you, you still feel that same pain. The reason that I, I don't think that we, we were, you know, there's the Insight program on SBS, and Cathy and I went on that program, and it was on perinatal mental health. And we came out of that program and we, we were really quite upset because we watched how the media manipulated the audience so that you had people crying and telling and, and they got these personal stories. Now, we were far further in the journey than that. And so, in fact, we were able to talk quite comfortably. And, and so I think the reason, long way to the answer to your question, which is that the reason that I don't feel an anxiety about sharing is because I'm coming from such a powerful position. I have my sense of self, we have our sense of self, and so I can reveal my vulnerability without feeling vulnerable. Yeah, and so, and, and I, I caution people from doing the same thing. Hmm. When people say that they want to get, get up and give a speech and tell something personal, I say you've really got to think about whether you're ready in that journey to do that. And you have that sense of self, but want to go back now sort of to your time at medical school. And we have a, another question from one of our medical students who uh, very much sort of uh, related to your observation about struggling with exams. So uh, the question is, what advice would you give to a medical student who's failed multiple rotations and has fear of failure and lacks confidence? Mm. So the first bit of advice I would give, and I'm not an academic and I'm not a, uh, an educationalist, is to the academics and educationalists in the audience, which is that we need to rethink the way that we assess people. Because exams, I think, um, and, and the people with your qualification will know much more about this than I do, but I think we need to really think about whether exams give us a true measure of that person's value. 
which then helps us to answer the question, which is to that person who is struggling with exams, actually, unfortunately, that is the barrier that you will need to get over in order to pass it, to get your medical degree. But in your head, you, you need to know that that's a formula or a skill that you need to learn. The inability to fail is actually not a measure of your worth or your knowledge or, um, or, or, your, or, the, or the potential for you to become a doctor. So to separate those two things, that you still, it's, it's the same. If you, if you want to get your driver's license, there's a set of rules, and I'm sorry, we can argue forever about whether you're a competent driver or not, but if you went a little bit over that line, that's a mandatory fail and that's the deal. It's done. That's how the rules are written. So it's the same. You have to pass those exams and there's no way of getting around that because that's a set of rules. But don't conflate that. Don't don't get that confused with your own inherent self-worth. Okay. I think uh, I very much sort of uh, relate to that and sort of building on that and that sort of sense of self-worth, uh, I think at the heart of, 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 of who you are, I, I pick, took away tonight the sort of sense of service and a sense of kindness, that sort of generosity of spirit. Where did that come from? So... I am a very atheist Catholic, and so uh, I, I was born and brought up a, a Catholic, and, and um, I, I'm not going to get into that controversy, but I, I am not totally convinced that religion makes an enormously valuable contribution to the world. But one of the, and the, the tiny bit, or no, a significant bit of Catholicism that I, I related to and continue to relate to is the concept of service of others. Mm-hmm. That, and, and, um, and social justice and, and the importance of caring for others. And I think that became ingrained in my head from an early age, or that was the message that I took away. And so that, that became part of the way that I thought. The kindness thing, I just think it's just so much pleasure in being kind. It's just so nice. You know, it, 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 you, you, the reward that you get out of kindness is it's fantastic, and uh, I I just like it. You know, it's just it, 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 it's just a fantastic way to be. And Kathy, I mean, you've probably heard me. Speak, you've heard the word Kathy here every second word because that she is a reference point for me, and she is someone from whom I learned yesterday on Friday. Yesterday, um, she uh, had to give a talk at her school, and she was asked to talk about women who inspired her. It's International Women's Day on Monday. And she talked about her aunt who had been the headmistress of the school. And uh, then she talked about some, uh, her, her mother. And then she finished off by saying that it wasn't necessarily people's deeds or successes or titles that inspired her. What inspired her was kindness. And I thought that was actually incredibly profound, is that if you think about even the, the teachers who received their award today, what all of those students saw in them was a variation or a, an aspect of kindness. If you think about what gift you can give to somebody, it will be kindness. That will be what they would value more than anything else. And we certainly got a sort of sense of that from your speech, but also the sort of the small acts of kindness you talked about, that sort of smile in response as part of that relationship, sort of transforming uh, that from a transactional interaction to a relational, that sort of connectedness. Um, and I'm sorry that we squeezed you into a chair, uh, into a very small chair on the Qantas flight up here. No, no, uh, no. no. <laughs> See, this is also another thing, is that I, 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 I am uncomfortable with... So Udi <laughs> said, uh, you have to buy a business class seat, you have to buy a business class seat. And I thought, and the president of the college, our, our rules say that you're entitled to fly business class, but it's a membership-based organisation. And I think, well, I don't want to waste the members' money. And so it's not because I, I think I'm not worthy or it's not even, you know, I should, I'm not trying to have a sort of hair shirt mentality. I just think it seems, it's just, I don't need that. I don't want that. I just, that doesn't attract me. Um, and so, no, no, I, we were, there's a very, very big bloke who sat down next to me. I was like, <laughs> so it was a bit like this. But, um, but uh, no, 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 I'm perfectly happy in that seat. Because, and actually, to, to link it to what I said before, I am actually quite happy in that seat. Mm. 
because I'm there in my little space. I always get the window seat and I do. I just get into this like little cocoon and I read my book or I fall asleep. Um, and uh, it, it's this little safe space because I think, I feel, and like I said, I'm not blaming anyone else for this. It's a choice that I make. But I feel that I have this very public life, not necessarily on a big public scale, but but constantly interacting with people, constantly talking to people. I, I constantly feel that when I get to work in the morning and I park in the garage and if I'm running late, I actually deliberately avoid people because otherwise I feel like I'll have to chat to them and then I'm going to be late, even more late, and so I sort of walk around them. Um, and, uh, and, and I go different routes through the hospital so I won't walk, walk past the nurse's station because I know that I'll end up in another conversation conversation and so I think that uh, the economy seat was fine <laughs> and it wasn't that was my choice. <laughs> I know that our audience will have lots of other questions uh, to ask you and there's a reception afterwards where there'll be plenty of opportunity for them to ask them directly but I have a final question for you. What does life mean to you? So I wanted to, I, I was hoping that I might have an opportunity, it didn't quite fit in with the speech but during this week International Women's Day on Monday. During this week uh, in Melbourne, Professor Christine Tippett, who was a president of the of Ransco, um, she died. So we've only had 10 presidents, we've only had one female president. And she's this extraordinary woman, inspirational, hardworking, fearless. She's a, a, a mother of four children, forged a career in obstetrics and gynaecology, went on to become a leading academic. Uh, and when I became president, took me under her wing, sat down. She wasn't one of those people who sort of, you know, warm and fuzzy puts her arms around you, which I was actually looking for, but she's sort of more like a tough love kind of person, and um, which is probably more what I needed. And, and so she died. And it's been interesting. At first, we, we knew that she was unwell. We knew that she would die. You sort of accept it when you hear it. But more and more, we've reflected on that over the week. And a, and a friend of ours, and, and Jeff, you mentioned Sue uh, Walker. So Sue sent me um, a poem that she, or sorry, a, a quote from George Bernard Shaw that uh, he felt epitomised Christine. And it was one that I actually really, I think, this is what I want. This is how I think I want my life to be. So I'll finish with this, which is to say, this is the true joy in life, being used for a purpose recognised by yourself as a mighty one, being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish little clot of ailments and grievances complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. I am of the opinion that my life belongs to the whole community and as long as I live, it is my privilege to do for it what I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die, for the harder I work, the more I live. I rejoice in life for its own sake. Life is no brief candle to me. It is a sort of splendid torch which I have got hold of for the moment and I want to make it burn as brightly as possible before handing it on to future generations. Thank you, Vijay. It's been a privilege. And thank you uh, to you and Kathy for sharing your story. Thank you. Thanks a lot.